Hey everybody, I'm Nick Sanker and welcome back for another episode of The Huddle. I've got a really special conversation lined up today all about pursuing success, what it takes and what it means. I've got a really special guest with us today, Mike Semth, a Princeton football alum who's been crushing it in business, health and just life in general. In today's episode, we're going to be touching on Mike's journey and really deep diving into what success means to him and how Princeton has helped shape his path. We're going to be touching on motivation, how he's overcome failure, and really the habits and routines that have shaped his uh, path to success. So really appreciate you making it out here, Mike, and I'm excited to have this awesome conversation. It's such a pleasure to be here today. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome, awesome. Well, I wanted to kick it off with this question uh, to really, really something that I'm curious to hear is what was the most impactful memory that you have from Princeton. This can be either for good or for worse, but something that really uh, stood out during your experience at Princeton as a student athlete. Well, I think they'd fall into two camps, if I can give you two rather okay. than one. Yeah. <clears throat> the athletic equation was really a big part of my four-year experience, and I had a tremendous first two years because we had the coaching staff that I had been recruited by, and they represented everything that I thought Princeton football was supposed to be about. And then after my sophomore year, they traded out that entire coaching staff for a group that I know my classmates would agree did not align with any of those principles. And mm. so it was a pretty rough two years. I'm proud of the fact that I was a fresh, uh, earned a freshman and three varsity letters. I'm proud that I was a starting offensive tackle senior year after playing defense for three years. So I showed a lot of versatility and I got time on the field. And most importantly, I wore the orange and black proudly. So those were big deals for me. Um, but it was tough because I felt like they stole two years of my experience in some respects by not having a coaching staff that really understood what a Princeton Scholar athlete was supposed to be. And before you say your story, what would you say, or you can put this in it, what does it mean to be a Princeton Scholar athlete? It, it means you bring a level of expectation on and off the field that are equal. Number one, you're here for two purposes. A, number one, for an education, and B, to perform on the field and make yourself a better person as a result of that experience. We want to win here. Okay, Princeton is 100% about winning as an ethos, as a, as a mindset that athletes and non-athletes alike clearly share. But this is much more of a holistic environment than I think a lot of other elite schools provide in that regard because they give you perspective on real winning in life versus just, can I get that A number one investment banking job? Can I make as much money as possible? We see the world more broadly than a lot of other schools do. And so for me, the, the expectation was that I was going to get an environment that supported both aspects of that. Mm, that's mm -hmm. awesome. That's awesome. Now, let's hear your story. What's it? What's it? You know, the, the, the other, I think it was pretty special. To, I was an econ major. Okay. And uh, you write, as you know, two JPs and a senior thesis. And from one you of my two JPs as an econ major? Two JPs. They have one now. I did, I'm an econ what? major as well. Oh, come on. You guys are getting do, so soft. That's I only had to do one JP, and now I'm working on my senior well, You're very lucky. <laughs> um, I had a gentleman named uh, Burton Malkiel, one okay. of our professors, who is considered one of the greatest uh, visionaries on Wall Street and the markets. He's written one of the most famous books of all time, A Random Walk on Wall Street. And he was one of my JP advisors. Hmm. And Professor Spees, who was also the controller of Princeton, was my second JP advisor. So I thought I had done as well as I could do, and then I got assigned to a gentleman named Joseph Stiglitz for my senior thesis, who went on to win the Nobel Prize four years after I graduated. Wow. And in each of those cases, the advantage of that independent work was really distilling all the critical thinking skills you were supposed to be developing and applying them in an independent and research-based fashion. And then most importantly, coming up with conclusions that were defensible. Mm -hmm. And I think if you talk about the broader aspects of Princeton today and the point of critical thinking skills, it's about the ability to put aside bias, put aside idealism, come up with facts, 
and find a better answer based on facts. Hmm. And that's what Princeton's supposed to teach you, and that's what that independent work is supposed to challenge you with. I got a lot of that. I feel like I maybe put 20% into what I could have done if you'd given me another chance today. Hmm. You know the old phrase, uh, uh, many things are wasted upon the young, but certainly education is one of them because we're yeah. probably not as prepared as we could be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, it was, uh, it was a singular experience to work with men of that academic accomplishment. Yeah. I can totally agree and i think that right now i'm kind of experiencing the same thing of really being able to deep dive into critical thinking i'm right now working on my senior thesis which is on essentially wage suppression and how essentially the nfl labor market ecosystem and what are the inefficiencies what are the uh behavioral biases uh that are in there that are making it not as efficient as possible whether it be uh, players as a whole being paid less than they should or not, uh, or certain subsections being paid less uh, than they should. And I've been working with Ray Ryan, and he has helped me really take a step back and look at the previous literature and kind of all those contributions, like you said, and, and building off of them and looking at that discussion as a whole and being able to say here's where we are here's where the gaps are here's where we can build off what evidence do we need to be able to make these conclusions so on and so forth but i think that it really like you said brings together all of the different kinds of critical thinking uh, that you need and then be able to put it together into evidence-based conclusions and suggestions and it's it's a lot of work (laughs) it's probably more work than my other classes all combined right now but it's been really, really cool to see it all come together uh, as a whole. And so that's been a really cool experience. I actually had a senior thesis in high school, too. Um, I think it's just like the liberal arts education yeah. really helps you be able to take a step back and think, speak, write well. Uh, I get that kind of from my father, who was the headmaster at our high school that we went to, who really pushed that. But it's a really it's a really cool perspective to have. Um, and... What was your favorite moment from Princeton football? Uh, probably playing against Rutgers. Really? Second game of the season because that was by far the toughest, highest level of competition I'd ever faced. Yeah. Uh, the guys I played against that day, uh, Bill Pakel ended up being the other defensive end on the Oakland Raiders with Howie Long. And Dino Mangero ended up being the nose tackle for the Kansas City Chiefs. So... <laughs> Uh, you couldn't do much, much better than that. <laughs> yeah. Face competition to prove, and they threw me around pretty good for four quarters. Yeah, but it was the opportunity set to compete against people at that level that I will cherish forever. Mm, that that's really awesome, and it's like, in order to embrace that, you got to be embracing the willingness or the the chance that you might fail. Which Absolutely, is, which is scary, and I and I think it's really cool how that's just one of the many different ways that football personally has helped me grow so much in just mm. life all the lessons that come from it and i think that especially coach race and the princeton staff just really does an awesome job on focusing on how can how can you be the best you as a, as a person uh but what would you say were some of the biggest things that you learned during your time as a student athlete and just the ways that they translates into other areas of your life i think the first thing that happens when you get here depending on who each individual is, you've got different levels of self-confidence, different levels of expectation of where you're going to plug in. I know a lot of the players say to me when they've come here, they were nervous about their academic standing relative to the people that didn't play sports that would be extremely accomplished academically. I, I actually, I don't want, it wasn't an arrogance thing. I think I've always just set my mind on, I will be competitive and I will succeed wherever I go. That said, you enter your first fall semester as a freshman, and you do find out, like my story with Dino Mangero and Bill Pakel, this is serious. Yeah. Like, you've got everyone that was the top one, two, or three in your class is everyone in your class in high school, mm-hmm. is everyone in your class in college. Yep. And the best news about Princeton I found that that alleviated any anxiety I might have had when that realization became clear so quickly was that we appear to generationally attract a different sort of person than a lot of other elite schools. It's a, it's a place where people drive each other. 
to excellence. They do not look to carve themselves into you and take away from you for their own benefit. And I, that collaborative sense of, I want to be better, I'm going to push you in class because it's going to make me better, but it's going to make you better, and I understand that synergy, mm. that was very powerful and palpable for me very early on. Mm. And if I could have done anything different, and there were a lot of things I probably could have done different, but I did not take full advantage of that, meaning between football and the academics and being a teenager with your head spinning, you did n I did not consider the broader opportunity set of embracing everything this university had to offer. Hmm. You know, I'm auditing classes now yeah. that I never would have considered taking when I was here because I was so worried about a GPA. Yeah, yeah. And now I see that that is, that is a fail of the educational opportunity set at Princeton if you do that. I now, and I preach to you guys, take a class that has a math emphasis. It doesn't have to be in the math tower, the dark tower, it, but it should be, you should get some quantitative exposure, even if it means taking a C as a result of it. Yep. Because when you get into the rest of the world, as I used to say to people and my kids, numbers always tell a story. All you have to do is listen. If you're afraid of numbers, you're not going to see the story. Yeah, and I think I would totally agree. I think I've, I've been blessed uh, by having people that really emphasize process over outcomes in my yeah. life. Mm -hmm. And the, the people that don't really care about results the same way, I think my mom growing up, yeah, you wanted to get good grades, but she, didn't, she just wanted you to work hard and do the best that you can do. If you ended up having not a great grade or whatever, she's like, hmm, whatever. Uh, but, I mean, my dad was pretty pretty st strict on having great grades. But I think having that security, but also my high school football coach always was saying, if you embrace the process, the outcomes will come the way that you want. Love and it. so I think that that same mindset of I'm going to attack whatever class it is, I've had a C in a class, my econometrics class Perfect. that I had. Yep. Hardest class I've ever taken. Yep. Got a C. I don't know how I passed, but I did. And um, it, was, it was tough. It was really, really tough. But did I learn and get better at something? Absolutely. And it was part of my journey to be an e uh, of becoming an econ major here where I had to overcome these different hurdles or whatever. But now I'm, like you said, so much better at the numbers my grades may not have uh loved what i did but i got better and i think the toughest part with that is that it's so competitive here and i think there's 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 two sides to it one like you said i think surrounding yourself with high achievers and some of the smartest uh most driven people in the world it it just brings the standards up here and I think that it makes it so that you want to push yourself. You want to achieve more. And also, you have the best conversations. This is what I say every week when I, I talk about one of the most underrated parts of Princeton. Isn't the teachers. Isn't um, the the classes. It's, it's the people that you're always around. Absolutely. Because you can learn so much from the other students around you. And it just also creates an environment. Every time... Uh, I go home or the, my siblings are around my friends versus other like the rest of the world. They're always like, man, I can see why like you're the people that come out of Princeton are so successful is everybody is on top of their stuff. They even just like the way that people speak properly uh, and being in that environment. I think the people you surround yourself are one of the biggest indicators of who you become. So there's the, the, the that competition or that kind of environment that brings everybody up. But it's also tough because then you have almost like that comparison. And so you have to be willing to overcome that that, that feeling of comparison. Everybody else uh, is getting this job or getting these grades or doing this and that. And so you have to kind of quiet those and say, I just want to be the best me. And so I don't know if that was something that was kind of a thing for you back in the day well, let's let's separate it's great p points that you brought up let's separate the two of them because okay. the fact after the fact mm -hmm. is that great athletes on paper often don't translate to success 
on the field or in the real world. Mm. Go to the combine, see a guy jump 40 inches, say this guy's going to be an all-star in two years, and you never hear from him again. Mm. I hired a number of 4.0 and above people in the sciences out of this school. That would imply a massive capacity for intellectual capability. And yet, often, very often, those individuals could not translate that academic success into real-world productivity. Hmm. And so what's the dynamic there? What, well, it's, again, you've got a toolkit. I could give you one of those you know, $20,000 snap-on toolkits that you can buy, put you in a garage and say, get after that car. And you may say, the toolkit's great. I have no idea what to do with the car. <laughs> and, and that happens a lot. Yeah. And, it, and it happens in the real world just like it does in, in the classroom. And so you're right. We're all competitive. We're all geared. I want an A on everything. I mean, I want an A in life. My doctor even says that to me. When she wants me to change something in my protocol, she looks at me. And literally, she's used this line a hundred times with me. Well, Mike, if you're okay with a B instead of an A. And she knows what she's doing to me. Like, she's <laughs> got me after 16 years. She reads me like a book. Yeah. Absolutely, I want an A in everything. But yeah. what I really want is the toolkit so that in life I can get an A. Hmm. I want to be able to get dropped into different circumstances, different businesses, different dynamics within a certain moment in time and be able to immediately react and problem solve. And that's a varied toolkit. That is not just I'm the world's greatest Excel guy. It's great if you can do Excel and you're a junior person, just keep pumping out the numbers. Do you know the number of people that used to work for me that would give me immaculate runs and I'd say, explain to me what's going on in this cash flow statement? Hmm. Well, I can tell you where the numbers came from. Well, that's, that's interesting, but not that interesting. Yeah. Tell me what the numbers say. Tell me what the mission of the company is. Tell me what the challenges of the industry are today. So th there's this funny meeting of humanity and Darwinism that you have to accept in life. And the humanity part of it is, is being a good person and being able to deliver emotional intelligence in a business setting as well as in a personal setting and create relevance through connectivity and engagement. And then there's the absolute raw horsepower of being able to bring incremental thought to the circumstances. Both of those are required, mm -hmm. not just one, both. So you've got to be able to leave this university with enough of both to go out and kill it in the real world. Yeah, and one of the things that the theme of today's topic or episode is really what it means to be successful and what it takes to be successful. What would you say are the keys to being successful in, in, in this world now that we started on this topic? It's a great, great question. And the number one thing I preach to myself every day, and then I preach to everyone else who wants to come and have a conversation, is that self-awareness is the single most important foundation to success. Hmm. If you don't have a sense of self and where you're coming from, not just what motivates you and what you're good at, but generally where you sit in the world and where you want to be. How do you capture the energy that you have and apply it in the best possible way? We're not all going to be titans of industry. We're not all going to be the best surgeon on the planet. We're not all going to be, and we don't have to be to be happy. But if you've made it this far, you really do have motivation. It's just a question of how do you capture that motivation? For me, I have an insatiable intellectual curiosity. I just want to know. And back in the horse and buggy days when I was here and you had to go to Firestone Library to get all your information and textbooks, go to the used store and you walk out with a stack this high of hard textbooks, um, you had to hustle a little more at one level and it was way less efficient because of that. Yeah. But not just because of technology, but because of the path in life you choose. I thought long and hard about what I wanted my career to be and where I could get that intellectual stimulation every day. Yeah. And everybody today talks about investment banking and the first thing that comes to their mind is numbers. And I don't mean numbers on a spreadsheet, I mean dollar numbers. Yeah. They all think it's the key to making a lot of money. And they all think it's, oh my God, you gotta work so many hours. You know, th those are extraneous facts to me, to the core of what I wanted which was constant exposure to different industries, different best practices, the way people went to market, the way manufacturing was done. I just, 
it's fascinating to me. So every day I was excited to wake up. And that to me is the essence of success. Yeah. If you wake up every day, be excited. I think that's, that's so powerful because that is so important to me when I, at this stage, I'm even looking at what classes I want to do. Everybody, it's really interesting. When I, when I choose my classes, I found that it is easier for me to do a hard class that I'm interested in. Yes. Than something that's boring and technically super easy in terms of workload. I can't get myself to go to do something like, say, the history of art. That is the hardest class in the world to me because I am completely zoned out, don't want to understand, don't want to know, not really interested or curious about what is going on in that class. But if I go to, let's just say, right now I have economic lessons in the world of sports, super interesting class, way more work, or even the, this other class that I'm in, uh, high-tech entrepreneurship, tons of readings, tons of presentations, um, papers that I have to write, probably 10 times as much work. But I find that class so interesting and so enjoyable. And like you said, that all comes down to knowing yourself. And I find that my motivation is a huge part of understanding what makes things easier for me to do. And I find that really interesting that you say that as the first thing that comes to mind that is key to success. I think something else for me that I found really essential is just habits. Uh, whenever I always, people ask uh, or talk about their favorite books, the favorite book that comes up for me is Atomic Habits hmm. by James Clear. And it's really talking about <clears throat> the power of, of habits and 1% better in everything that you do. Yep. Um, he talks about, I think, I can't remember when, but it was the British Cycling um, the, their, I think it was their national team and how they brought in a new coach who basically changed the way that they do everything. He, he broke, took a step back and took everything that they do from what they wear to the seats to the wheels to everything about their training and diet and said, how can I make every little part 1% better? And cumulatively, it made a huge difference and they ended up having a ton of success. But I think having that same kind of mindset with everything that you do, how can I get these marginal gains or this little bit of a gain in all these different areas? But then on top of that, the other part that I really like about it is in order to succeed, it's not just about forcing yourself to um, have the willpower to choose the right thing. It's about making the right thing the easy choice. And so it's about being intentional and setting yourself up for success. And I think that all just connects back to understanding yourself thank you well done exactly where i was going to hope you were going that's exactly right and you know being honest about yourself means figuring out the degree of what we're talking about in the future even now the amount of data i have available to me on a physical level hmm. to improve myself of course on the one hand i think wistfully if i knew then what i know now but i'm at it every day in every way even though I'm 66 years old. Like Can you tell I, us about your, your routines that you go through, well, these I, habits? I, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you, a, a, you a snippet of what's changed for me okay. um, that ties into now what I do. Yeah. Two major things have happened to me and for me in the last two years. I have always been intensely focused on phys physical culture, nutrition, every aspect of well-being. When I was in... Uh, when I was an investment banker after I left Princeton, I got into powerlifting. I was working 100 hours a week. Yes, it is 100, so you can't hide from that, everyone who thinks you want to be an investment banker. <laughs> that is the number. Stop whining about it. Just embrace it. But I would walk down to the gym with my Texas Power Bar at midnight, and I would squat and I would deadlift and I would bench, and I ended up being able to squat and deadlift over 600 pounds drug-free and bench 350 weighing th 235 at 6'3", which doesn't mean I have great leverages. So that, why? Because I was just driven, even though I was at work, yep. pounding it out at work, there was another side of me that said, I have to actualize myself physically. In my 50s, when I knew I wasn't gonna throw that kind of weight around anymore, I transformed myself into CrossFit and I was top 200 in the world for five years in a row, which for an offensive or defensive lineman is a pretty unusual number. And I'm very proud of that too, yeah. but it involved a complete transformation of my mindset of what 
physical fitness meant. It didn't mean bulk. It didn't mean absolute lifts. It meant the capacity to do different kinds of work. Mm. So again, back to the story of making yourself better, a bunch of different opportunity sets. Love it. I love every chance to do that. So in the last couple of years, I developed an ITB problem on my left leg, which really became debilitating. Mm. It was too much squatting, but most importantly, too poor movement quality. You'd say, you squatted 600 pounds, how bad could your movement be? Well, I never activated a bunch of the muscle groups, particularly my hips and glutes, that I should have. Yep, I already know that. <laughs> and I found a physical therapist in New York who has completely re-engineered me. And for the first time in my life, I am doing things I could never do before. Hmm. So if you don't think that's motivating for me based on how I'm geared, I'm telling you every day, I'm thankful that I wake up and have the chance to work on this. Hmm. And on the, on the uh, chemical side, if you will, the chemistry side, <clears throat> I had a very extensive DNA test done recently, and it illuminated a bunch of things, behaviorally and otherwise, because these tests are really pretty special these days. Wow. Um, and it identified a number of adjustments to my nutrition and stress management protocols that could be major contributors as I continue to get older. And I have implemented every one of them. You know, red meat only once a week now. I love red meat. I'm not going to vilify red meat, but I have an issue with absorbing saturated fat. So I got to navigate around it hmm. and so on and so on. And so, I, so every time you give me a piece of data that's actionable, you make me happy. Because it's some, so back to self-awareness, which is where we started. That's the kind of self-evaluation everyone should do. How motivated am I? Mm. And, and this isn't a Western culture, everybody's gotta be here. Everybody's gotta be at the level they're at that will truly make them happy. And I can proselytize about, about uh, being the best you can be, continuous self-improvement, because it's what motivates me. You may not be that person, yeah. but at least, find enough of that in yourself to want to be a little bit better every day, which is re your point. Yeah, I think the really tough part about what we just talked about is that it seems like the key is to be able to slow down and give yourself the space to understand Perfect. who you are. Because nowadays, everybody is so busy all the time, feeling every second of their day, whether it be in a good way or just on social media or whatever it is. And so people are ending up lost and just trying to, I guess, pass the time and make it through rather than trying to make the most of what they're doing. And it, it's tough. I mean, this world is so full of distractions that you lose your time like that. Every single second that you have to even think is taken up, whether it be um, music I mean, everybody always has AirPods in. Everybody's uh, scrolling through social media. It's a TikTok generation. Uh, but I think that it's so important to be able to reflect. And I think the best way that I have found to reflect is to teach. It's actually very hmm. interesting in, that I, and it might just be me, <clears throat> but I think that forcing yourself to have to explain something to someone else finds all the chinks and finds out the true, truly what you're trying to say. And so I've had opportunities, let's just say athletes in action. I had to, um, I didn't have to, I had the opportunity to speak. Um, Bush, who's the chaplain for athletes in action, the Christian fellowship group on campus asked me to tell my story and to share a message. And I had been putting it off for forever but I found that once I went through it, I, it was so great for me because I was able to really do some deep self-reflection. Because when you have to say it to someone else, yes. you want to know what you're trying to say. <clears throat> you bet. And so that I found to be so helpful. And, I, and I, the same thing applies when I'm trying to learn things in general. But learning about yourself is so important in the best way that for me that I have found is trying to explain it to someone else and it doesn't even have to be like a presentation you can just have it through a conversation yes uh just like what we're, what we're doing right now but i think that like i said all comes back to do you do you put aside intentional time to do that which 
doesn't happen much nowadays. Well, but, but that's if you try to make it a compartmentalized event rather than a holistic, continuous event. Mm. I think no one wants to go through every step in life questioning the next step. I'm not suggesting that. But it is important to be constantly aware and move outside of the natural safety zones of your awareness. You know, it's everybody else's fault or mm. it's all my fault and I'm terrible. You know, those are the easy buckets to fall into. It's like the barbell strat strategy of emotion in life. Mm. Whenever you face anything that's a challenge, we always default into something that feels more like a stasis, a homeostasis safety zone. But you got to remember, homeostasis is, a, is an erosion over time because we just get older. And, and if you're not constantly stimulating and challenging yourself to get better, just staying pat means you're sliding back. And nobody should do that. Emotionally, Intellectually, physically, you should fight constantly to be aware of who you are, where you are, what you're saying, what you're doing, and, and ask yourself, is this the best choice for me? Objectively, not because it feels good. Objectively, have I just made the right choice? What's something in the last, let's just say, a couple of months that really challenged the way that forced you to rethink something in that kind of manner that, that challenged the way that you were doing or what you thought about yourself? If you're married, you challenge yourself every day. If you marry another type A person, believe me, you, you better be on your game every day. Mm. And it's just too easy in an in intimate emotional setting to get defensive, to, to feel exposed. Maybe that's a better way to put it. You know, there's so many opportunities in life to feel exposed. In the classroom, if I'm not getting a grade I think I should get, on the field if suddenly I'm not starting, but mainly in relationships, you feel exposed if you give of yourself, and then at a moment in time, there's some discontinuity, some miscommunication. Well, it takes real strength of character to step back and say, well, hold on. How do I think this person really feels about me? Am I really questioning how they feel about me? Hmm. Or is it just a default setting of, I'm going to put up my hands right now because I feel like I'm not prepared to see, maybe I made a mistake. You know, am I saying no just because, in truth, I'm the one that screwed up? Yeah. A lot. We do that all the, all the time. I've been doing that for 60 years, and my wife has finally broken me of that <laughs> because she's given me the trust and confidence to say, you can admit when you're wrong and not lose ground to another type A person. Maybe that's the best message that applies to everyone. You can be in this environment with the greatest, smartest, most driven people in the world, and it's okay to not be the guy that's right every time. And real leadership involves that ability to admit culpability, not just that shining star that always gets it right and is always in the front. And mm. I think it's hard for people to appreciate that. There, there are days when you're going to be dogging it. And, and that's the day where you start with yourself and pull yourself up. And by doing that, everybody else sees it and they pull themselves up too. That's what real leaders are. And believe me, in my opinion, people look to Princeton for leadership. And the world needs leaders now more than ever. So we need Princeton people to embrace this greater sense of personal mission and then external mission. Who have been some of the leaders in your life? It, and I think by leaders, it can also, I, I, I'm referring to mentors as well, because I think that's a huge part of people's development. And that's the other thing that I was going to say is keys to success. You talked about reflection. I talked about habits. And then now you're talking about leaders and, and, and mentors. Um, who have been some of the people that have been key to shaping uh, your success and you now as a leader? Uh, you know, my dad was clearly number one. Uh, you know, my dad was a World War II veteran, led a battalion onto Omaha Beach and took three bullets for it during World War II. Came home completely stoic about it, couldn't lift his arm above his head. But, you know, we never heard about it because he just got on with life. And, you know, his story, starting out driving an oil truck and selling school books out of the back of a van at night to the point where he was president of the largest book publishing company in the world. You know, that, that kind of Horatio Alger-like rise was something I was aware of only because laterally I understood the story over time. But what I did understand was the accountability that he expected and he created for me in a loving, caring, this is for your own good way. You know, we talk a lot about parents today trying to be friends, not parents. Your dad clearly was not that way, and you benefited from it. You acknowledge it today. So, you know, he was my first mentor, absolutely. He held me to standard. Um, and after he died when I was in high school, and I had some rocky days. You know, the, the years through college 
My mom had a lot of health issues. Um, my mom was a genius, but she was very difficult. And, um, you know, trying to navigate that, I was a bit lost. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, when I started work, and I, right when I needed a real kick in the ass, I got, uh, I built a relationship with a guy that is a very famous strength and conditioning coach, now passed away, named Dr. Ken Leisner. And he was very much like my dad, maybe more rough hewn, but same kind of message. Don't really care about what you want to complain about today. Just not interested. Get under the bar and give me 30 squats. Hmm. And, and it was talking to him over time and his same level of, Mike, you need to deliver because you have capability. And he held me to that. So I do well with the tougher love inspiration, if you will. And then I got into work and the same thing, you know, I second year, uh, third year as an associate, um, I had a project that I just blew up on. I, I had a junior person work for me. I let her do all the work, didn't check the work, got a call from the board meeting from the vice president leading the meeting. Hey, Mike, all the numbers are wrong. CFO has identified all these mistakes. I want to talk to you tomorrow in my office. Boy, you know, you want to talk about a stress night and coming in the next day. And he could have absolutely just peeled my skin off and kicked me out of the firm. And instead he said, you know, Mike, that's, you got one more shot. Can you make it work? And I went from bottom of the pile to top of the pile in one year hmm. because he gave me the chance and because his work ethic and his tenacity and his attention to detail, most important, was something that suddenly I embraced as a result of that experience and him giving me a chance to do that. Yeah, one of the big things I'm taking away from that is, and this is something that I've learned from, one of, probably the biggest lesson that I've learned is you can't make yourself a victim. Thank you. I that, think, well, God, that's the best part of this whole broadcast. That's exactly right. I think if there's one thing I, I've learned from my father in, in my entire life that I always remember is that you can't make yourself a victim. You can't feel bad for yourself. Life is tough. Life is unfair. Get over it. And don't like, how can you overcome it? My, my dad, um, was like yours, very, very tough and maybe not always the most understanding, but I think that really comes from his background, his story. And for, I mean, context for those who don't know, my dad grew up in inner city DC, um, uh, in the most poverty stricken ghetto areas and he had his, his dad was in World War II, um, very abusive, not a mm. great dad at all. Um, never went to a single one of his football games ever. Uh, and his mom was his rock. Um, she really took care of him. Uh, a strong Christian uh, woman, and she worked at when I mean, she was younger. She worked as a um, house made for another wealthier family in a different district. Um, so when he was really little, he actually had the opportunity to go to an elementary school in that area because the Jewish family that she was caring for um, said they can, he can use their address. And so he was able to see kind of what the rest of the world was like hmm. uh, and grow up in with an outside perspective. But when he got to middle school, the family moved away and he had to go back to where he came from, which was Shaw Middle School. Um, in middle school, he had to get up every day at four in the morning to do the paper to help pay for the rent because his dad didn't really do anything. Um, and at that middle school, they had metal detected head, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. He said, in, I think it was sixth or seventh grade. I think there were like six or seven girls that were pregnant. Um, it was insane. Uh, it was really, really tough. But when he got to high school, he was lucky enough to be get an, a scholarship to go to Gonzaga, where actually Harrison Caponiti, who's a former teammate of mine, Alex Cherry, who's a former teammate, their dads went ended up there as well and mm. played on the same high school football team as my dad, which is kind of crazy. But it was still a tough world. And even though he went to a, a better school in high school, I mean, his junior year, he his family got evicted from their house. He can, he remember he remembers clearly. He came home from from school and all their stuff was on the street or it used to be because it was gone now and so he has almost nothing from his childhood and they packed up whatever they could put it in a car and went to a motel and he said the first thing he did was do his homework and figure out 
how to get to school the next day. Um, and when he got to school, this ties back to the mentor. He went to see his freshman uh, football coach, who was their PE teacher at school, uh, Coach Jackson. And this is the he. My dad has Alzheimer's. For those who don't uh, remember, but. Uh, he did, can't really say, remember any names or anything now, but one of the f- names that stuck around the longest with him was Coach Jackson. That's how important <clears throat> in, uh, he was in his life. And Coach Jackson had one message for him when he got there. Shed a quick tear and move on. You can't feel bad for yourself. You have to keep pushing. And that's the kind of message that stuck with him for his whole life. Everything he did from then on and kind of at that point in, in the way that he lived is like, you can't feel bad for yourself. And that's what he needed because if he felt bad for himself, that doesn't make anything better. Um, and he ended up going and playing college football at Colgate. Uh, and, and then eventually worked CIA for a little bit and then ended up in education was a headmaster, uh, at where I went to high school or when I grew, where I grew up going to school. But, It's crazy how that lesson that taught him so much is just the lesson that everybody needs to hear. It it is so true. And when I became a mentor in my professional career, the reality of mentorship within a work environment is exactly what you outlined, which is I want you to succeed. But just to be clear, it's, it's not this is not a charity and I'm also not a counselor that you've hired. I want you to succeed because I want to succeed. And I maybe see the investment in you more clearly than a lot of people in a position like mine where they might have just said, just give me the work, Nick. I don't care what happens to you after that. Just give me the work for as long as you're doing the work. I saw the greater benefit of investing in those people, but my message always was the same. You want to succeed? Work's got to be done. Work's Mm got to be right. And you may or may not ultimately have the skill set to continue to move up. So I'm going to encourage you and give you hard, clear feedback every step of the way of if you can make it to the next rung. You know, it's, it's a pyramid, and it's a short, steep pyramid, and you either make managing director or you're out. Hmm. There's no in-between. There's no hovering one level below. And so it's a, it's a pretty, again, Darwinian environment. Hmm. And yet you, you can help people and help yourself if you keep them focused on the reality that you just talked about. Yeah, it's like what everybody says here toughest coaches your toughest teachers are always the ones that do look back and are most grateful for absolutely and yeah so i mean kind of the biggest takeaways that i've gotten from this is like the four big keys that i see are understanding yourself creating great habits and processes in your life instead of focusing on the outcomes um having great mentors and not making yourself the victim uh, I think those are personally what I believe some of the most important things. When you surround yourself with great people and you are able to embrace failure and, re- and not feel bad for yourself and continue to push, uh, that's when you achieve some of the greatest things. But I think I'd be curious to hear from you throughout your all your experiences to uh, what for you did success look like? Uh, success for me was a unfortunately winning. I mean, I, I, I lost three mandates in 35 years as an investment banker that I competed for because I just would not accept losing. But I'm very satisfied with that. But moreover, it was the client relationships I made that became the differential reason that I won those mandates that meant a lot to me, that I resonated with every client I ever pitched. And they came to trust me and believe that I was going to do the best possible job for them, that validated me. It wasn't just the winning that would validate me. That's, you know, it's like money. Money's great. Everybody likes money. Money is not the yardstick of success. It's do you get validated in the way you define yourself as a person? And do you wake up every day with a continuous improvement mindset that says with every person I interface with, winning will mean them thinking well of me and me being able to get the job done. That, that is the, the override for everything I do. And so even in retirement now, I wake up every day with that same mindset. I don't care whether it's ordering a cup of coffee at Small World or it's dealing with you guys to the extent you allow me to do that or anything else. It's, it's how can I make a difference? 
How can I create engagement with you that you will benefit from that'll make me feel that I'm actually serving a purpose? Mm. It's powerful. Uh, and I L- think Life's that's... great because it can be powerful. That's yeah. the point. Get out of your comfort zone and see the greatness that life offers, even under the most difficult... You called it out. Life's difficult. Well, are you going to go into the hole? Or are you going to pick up and start firing back at life? You know, hide in the foxhole or step up and get it done. I, I, why, why give up? Why take the easy path? You know, it's, uh, I, I don't know what the validation in that is, but that's just how I'm geared. Back to the point of your gearing. But I think everyone at whatever level they're at can benefit from that kind of self-reflection and that positivity. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up on that. Uh, I appreciate you making it out here and sharing this this awesome stuff. I really appreciate the conversation. Love the conversation, and I love the alignment because I everything you're experiencing makes me extremely confident in your future. <laughs> I appreciate that, but yeah, I think just football is such a powerful tool, and sports are such a powerful tool. Because at the end of the day, when you're on the field, you need to, like Coach Gulucci says, figure it out. I love him, and that's exactly why you should love him. Well done. (laughs) Well, anyways, that's a wrap uh, for today's episode. Uh, Really enjoyed it, and can't wait to see what we got in next episode. Thanks, Nick. Thank you.